Duke basketball had their best month of basketball here in January since February of 2022. Why was Duke so successful this month? Let's talk about that. We've got a big game coming up on Saturday. The greatest rivalry in sports, Duke and North Carolina from Chapel Hill. Let's have a good one. Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Lockdown Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Lockdown Blue Devils podcast. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you for being here with us on Wednesday, January 31st of the year 2024. Excited to be talking about everything going on in the life of Duke Athletics. As we get set to get started here on today's show, we've got a lot that we want to discuss with you here on the program, including Duke's most recent win over Virginia Tech. Duke basketball also getting set for a massive game coming up this weekend against North Carolina. If you have not done so already, please be sure to follow and subscribe to Lockdown Blue Devils for free wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Leave us a five-star rating and written review. Make sure that you watch our show each and every day on YouTube. Hit that thumbs up button. Share this video with your friends. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're getting much closer to 2,000 subscribers, and I really do appreciate all the support that we're getting here on Locked On Blue Devils. So without further ado here on today's show, joining me is our good friend, Kevin Conley, the site expert from Ball Durham, who's here with us now. Kevin, thanks for the time as always. How are you? Excited to be here with you on the program and excited to talk about this Duke basketball team fresh off a win in Blacksburg against Virginia Tech. It is a place where the Hokies are, have pretty much dominated Duke. Duke won in five in their last six. What was most impressive to you in the game on Monday? I think it was the offense. I think the offense really stood out to me. Um, Virginia Tech is a team that is really good at home, as you just documented, um, specifically against Duke as a team that can really bury you quickly with how the crowd gets into it, how good of three-point shooters there are, Hunter Couture specifically, and um, defensively, D- Duke did a good job not letting him get a lot of three-pointers. It was only two for four in the game. Um, but the way Duke responded, Virginia Tech's offense was working pretty well. They were going inside. They were working efficiently. But Duke never let it get out of hand. I think the biggest run Virginia Tech might have had was at the end of the first half when Duke got the lead up to 12, I was, I believe it was. Um, and then Virginia Tech dwindled it all the way down. And then Jeremy Roach, the big three-pointer, at the buzzer in the first half to make it a five-point lead going into halftime, I believe. And then right out of the first uh right out of halftime, Kyle Filipowski scoring and pushing the lead right back to seven. I think that was the biggest sequence of the game for Duke because that's what felt like Virginia Tech got all the momentum. It was very similar to the Clemson game where Duke got up double figures right around in the under four media timeout. And then Clemson came back. And obviously we know how that game went back and forth in the second half. So I think Duke showed a lot of maturity, a lot of growth despite it just being a one-day break on that Sunday um, from a Saturday late afternoon game to a Monday night game. Uh, But the offense, I think, the ball was moving, there was rhythm to it, and there was constant baskets that didn't allow Virginia Tech to build multiple of those long runs. Such a big fan of what Duke was able to do on the offensive end of the floor, and it started on the defensive end to set up the offense. As we've talked following the game, Tyrese Proctor was interviewed on the court by ESPN, and he discussed – how great the defense performance was for Duke and allowing them to get into their half-court sets and set up what they want to run offensively, getting good looks on the inside for Kyle Filipowski and the ability to kind of kick out to shooters for this Duke basketball team. We've talked about it throughout the season when our big analytical friends join the program. They're quick to tell you that this Duke basketball team is truly special and one of the best in the entire country when it comes to half-court offense in particular. And Proctor basically echoed that after the game. Like, yeah, look, when we can dictate the tempo ourselves, run when we want to, but find good shots on the offensive end, we're a really tough team to beat, but it does start on the defensive end. What do you think of all of that? Like Duke's wanting to make it a focus to run offense in the half-court. 
Well, no, I think it's very important. And one thing I want to add on to that is how balanced they were against Virginia Tech. It wasn't just one player doing all the work. It was Caleb Foster starting off hot from three-point range. Obviously, Tyrese Proctor got going in the second half. Jeremy Roach coming off the bench and hitting four threes. Kyle Filipowski doing what he does. And even Jared McCain, his shot wasn't really falling. He was just three of ten from the floor, one of six from three-point range. But he impacted the game in other ways. He comes down with ten rebounds. That's what you have to do, especially on the road, if you're going to win basketball games. If your shot's not falling, find another way to impact the game and be successful for your team. Uh, Mark Mitchell. Only had eight points, but they were big eight points, right? The big dunk that really um, sealed the game at the end. Uh, I, I think Duke just did a fantastic job, and I can't I can't continue this without mentioning Ryan Young. Ryan Young was awesome. That might have been the best game um, Ryan Young has played in a Duke uniform. I know he was really good um, against Baylor and against Michigan State this year as well, but I think this game against Virginia Tech is right up there as well, 10 points, five rebounds, and about 15 minutes of action. So I, I think the balance that Duke showed on Monday night was really impressive as well. Where does this Duke team need to improve? Like when you look at the game on Monday, what kind of jumped out to you? And here's kind of where I'll start, Kevin. When you look at the numbers for the Duke basketball team and you could pair game by game, again, this is a 10-point win in conference play that we're talking about against a really good Virginia Tech team. So all in all, very positive that this took place. But when you're looking for things to critique – the Duke basketball team did turn it over 14 times. That's the most, tied for the most that they've had all season, tied with that pit game that Duke actually won. Not the loss at home, but the win on the road. Duke also had 14 turnovers. And that one against Michigan State, Duke had 13 turnovers and won that game. So their worst three games with turnovers, they've actually won those games. The drop-off down to 11 uh, turnovers in about five or six games, and that's where a few of those losses are sprinkled in for Duke. So that's one thing. The most turnovers that Duke has had, tied for the most, I should say, this season. And then additionally, on the offensive end of the floor, while they shot the ball really well from outside, and maybe this is a contributing factor to it, Virginia Tech only committed 10 fouls. That is by far the fewest against any opponent this season. So here we are, what, 20 official games into the season, Duke with the 16-4 and four record, and we just had the game where the opponent committed the fewest fouls. Yeah, I think those are two really good points. The one thing I would say was I think this team has to do a better job at getting to the free throw line. It just doesn't seem, because of how great of a shooting team this is, they're not really attacking, they're not really driving. It feels like it is Kyle Filipowski or Mark Mitchell who's shooting the most free throws throughout the course of a game just because they're the guys inside banging bodies down low with the opposition. Um, I'm going to say something off the court as well, and I think it's their maturity and how they deal with success because, like we talked about, you get up double digits late in the first half against Clemson and you blow it, and it's a game that, let's be honest, you probably should have lost, and you make a couple of big plays at the end to win the game. So credit to you. You are able to respond. Um, same thing here against Virginia Tech. You get up double figures late in the first half and you squander it and really you almost go in – um, only leading by a bucket or nearly tied at halftime if Jeremy Roach doesn't come up with that big three-pointer and then Kyle Filipowski's layup to begin the second half. So I think this team, now obviously when Duke gets up double figures, the other team's not just going to put their hands up and say, all right, this team's up double figures. We're just going to go home and, and quit. No, they're going to continue to fight back and battle hard and try and get themselves back in the game. But I think Duke has to realize that, that the other team's going to come back and, and play harder and play tougher and try and claw themselves back in. Um, and I think they have to realize that and still continue to run their offense, which we've seen with such, a, such great efficiency this season, um, instead of settling and that allowing the other team to get back in the game. So um, what you just mentioned, and as well as um, dealing with success, is another area of improvement I think this team still, still needs to improve on. Duke is now 11-1 and one over the last 12 games. They went 7-1 and one in the month of January, their best winning percentage since February of 2022, their best month of January since 2019. That was a Duke team with Zion Williamson and R.J. Barrett, Cam Reddish, those guys making a trip and a run all the way to the Elite Eight. North Carolina comes up on Saturday. How could Duke continue their winning ways? That is a big question that we've got to answer, and we'll begin to do that after our first time out here on today's episode of Locked on Blue Devils. 
Lockdown Blue Devils here today is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. That's right, the Super Bowl is here, and we want to celebrate that Super Bowl with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, and placing some good bets. FanDuel has so many ways for you to send or end the season with a W. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers can join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on to go ahead and sign up. Again, new customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL, and the Locked On Podcast Network. Moving forward here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils, J.J. Jackson alongside my friend Kevin Conley, the site expert for Ball Durham. We're getting set for Duke and North Carolina. Duke's playing some really good basketball right now. Again, they've won 11 of their last 12 games, and they've got a big showdown with the Tar Heels in Chapel Hill. The top two teams in the conference – North Carolina had yet to lose a conference game until last night. The Tar Heels went to Atlanta. They played Georgia Tech, and it's the Yellow Jackets who picked up a one-point victory. Georgia Tech, as we remember, also beat Duke at home back in December. What did you make of that performance, Kevin? Because, uh, look, I'll be honest, I I didn't think Georgia Tech would be able to pull that off against UNC last night. Neither did I, and it's funny. We were talking off air. It's like Georgia Tech doesn't show up against anybody else on their schedule, but when they play Duke and North Carolina, they play like a top <laughs> 10 team in the country. I mean, you mentioned them beating Duke in Atlanta. Um, then they gave Duke everything they could have possibly asked for in Cameron, and now they play the Tar Heels in Atlanta, and they beat them. Obviously, a lot of controversy coming at the end of the game. Um, did R.J. Davis get fouled? Did he not get fouled? I personally think he did. Um, now, I think him fading away um, instead of going into the defender maybe made the referees not blow their whistle and call a foul and put Davis at the line for two shots to potentially tie or win the game for North Carolina. Obviously, a lot of them are bringing up that Tyrese Proctor gets fouled um, at the end of the Clemson game on Duke's home floor, and Duke ends up winning the game as he makes two free throws, but that's just part of the rivalry, right? But I'm looking more at not that last play for North Carolina. I'm looking at the 8 of 28 they shot from three-point range. I'm looking at the 9 of 17 they shot from the free-throw line. Um, It was one of the worst games North Carolina has played in conference play, and it comes on the road, and and you wonder, um, were they looking ahead to Duke on Saturday? Now, I think it's two different teams when you look at it. Like Duke wasn't looking ahead to North Carolina, obviously, because they know they have history in Blacksburg, and they can't win in Castle Coliseum. And they were solely focused on that game, knowing that it was an important game and they needed to win. North Carolina doesn't have that history with Georgia Tech. And Georgia Tech, when you look at the standings, at the bottom of the ACC. So it's easier for North Carolina to overlook a Yellow Jacket team and look ahead to the Blue Devils than it was for Duke to overlook Virginia Tech and, and peek ahead to the Tar Heels. So I think that's the two difference, right? Two differences in those teams in their games leading up to Saturday night. Um, yeah, but for, for North Carolina, was it a foul at the end? Yeah, I think so. Um, but y- you can't complain that much when you're 8 of 28 from three-point range and more specifically 9 of 17 from the free throw line. Duke was riding a uh, 10-game winning streak earlier in the season when it came to a close in that game against Pitt. North Carolina was on a 10-game winning streak as well, looking to push that thing to 11, but uh, all for naught as Georgia Tech picks up the one-point victory over the Tar Heels. And now we've got a big showdown on Saturday. Number three, North Carolina. Number seven, Duke. Before we kind of get into the matchup specifically and things to kind of be on the lookout for, as we kind of look back over these last 12 games and really through the month of January to open up this 2024 season, big picture with this Duke team. What are you noticing? What are some of those positives for this Duke squad right now, Kevin? Well, it's crazy, right? This team is 11-1 and in their last 12, and the only game they lost came at home against Pittsburgh in a game where they didn't have two starters in Jeremy Roach and Mark Mitchell. 
you wouldn't really believe that with the narrative around this team on social media, right? With the way that they've struggled um, against Clemson, not looking good at home. They didn't look great, if we're being honest, on the road against Louisville. Obviously, the Georgia Tech game, they didn't look great either. Um, if, if you want to go back a little bit more, um, not looking great against Notre Dame on the road at the beginning of the month. Um, so it's kind of crazy how the narrative really has changed around this team just with, just with one great game on the road against Virginia Tech. But you look up and you're like, yeah, man, this, this is a team that only lost one game in the month of January. Um, they only have one loss since uh, that tough loss on the road against Georgia Tech back in early December. Um, so you look up and you're like, how is this the number seven team in the country? It doesn't really look like it when I watch them on television, but somehow they just find a way to keep winning and that has to be credited. They find a way to win games that they probably shouldn't. And that should go a long way um, as we now approach the biggest games of the season in February and obviously into Mar March. So it's going to be interesting to see if they keep this up and, and continue their winning ways. I'm seeing so much of what you're seeing, Kevin, in terms of what social media and the online discourse is about the Stuke basketball team in particular. And you mentioned kind of the narrative shifting. I want to help lead that charge, right? Like I've always been known as – uh, the optimistic voice of the bunch out there and really excited about what is able to be accomplished by the Duke basketball team in particular. And so let's do that, Kevin. Let, let's continue to kind of spin this back a little bit and to add more kind of proof to what this Duke team is certainly capable of. And then also, hey, this is a top 10 matchup. People might be surprised that Duke has climbed back up to number seven in the country. That would not have happened if they lost to Clemson over the weekend, but for basketball fans that watch the show each and every day or listen to our podcast each and every day that might not be as tuned in to what's happening across the sport, this really isn't that strange because if you look across the sport, there has been almost an abnormal amount of ranked teams in college basketball like losing to unranked opponents on the road, a few at home, like this hasn't been a basketball season with teams that are just super, super, super elite, or at least a handful of those teams that are elite. If you'll just kind of speak to what we're seeing nationally in the landscape. Yeah, it's interesting. It feels like since um, the COVID seniors, the transfer portal and NIL all really have merged together as one, it seems like we're seeing a lot of parity right now in college basketball. The way, the th the way you just described it, in my opinion, there's two dominant teams right now in college basketball, and it's the number one and number two teams in the country, the defending national champion UConn Huskies and the Purdue Boilermakers. Now you look ahead. I feel like a lot of people right now are pegging UConn to repeat as champions. Everyone obviously knows how tough that is once you get into the NCAA tournament. Um, for Purdue, their March struggles have been well documented. Um, so... I think people still have a lot of questions about them. Can they win when it gets to the big stage right now? But yeah, you look up and down the top 25, even beyond um, teams, teams are struggling. It, it is difficult to win on the road in college basketball. Um, and UConn sitting at 18 and two producing at 19 and two have found a way to do it. Um, and, and it's, it's certainly, if you wait until March to follow college basketball, you're missing out. Because, like I said, with those three things of the transfer portal, NIL, and COVID seniors, which are coming to an end now, either this year or next year, definitely, um, there's a lot more parity in college basketball. Just look at the Final Four last year with UConn, Miami, San Diego State, and Florida Atlantic. I mean, that wouldn't happen um, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so now it does happen, and um, you certainly have a lot more games to to get your eyes on, especially with streaming and, and with all these games being broadcasted. So, um, yeah, I think it's fun. There's not a lot of dominant teams, but right now I would say UConn and Purdue are those top two. Yeah, one year left to go. As we talked about a few weeks ago, you look at what to, what's coming for Duke basketball in terms of scholarship allotments and that sort of thing. Jeremy Roach and his senior class, should they want to take a COVID year, they are granted that by the NCAA. So one more season left to go, Kevin, and then we can finally kind of get back to just four years. Yeah, it, it's funny because you're still thinking. You're like, like, does he have one more year left? Yeah, and, and finally next year <laughs> it, it, it comes it comes to an end. So um, makes us to think about one thing less. Yes. Uh, going forward.
And that's what we like. All right, well, we got to think about this Duke and North Carolina game in Chapel Hill. It's going to be an exciting one Saturday night in the Dean Smith Center. We'll talk about that after one more timeout here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils. Locked On Blue Devils here today is brought to you by our friends over at Jace Medical. I know that we come to sports often to escape from some of the crazy realities of real life, but let's talk for just a minute about preparing for real life. According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than not being able to have access to the medication that you need due to some of the supply chain issues that are taking place. Thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. Make sure you visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It'll be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. So go ahead and go to jacemedical.com and use offer code LOCKEDON, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, to get $20 off your order. Once again, jacemedical.com using promo code Locked On for $20 off your order. Jace Medical, a proud sponsor of Locked On Blue Devils. Find a few moments here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils. Kevin Conley's here with me. Give him a follow on social media at Kevin Conley24 for all of his Ball Durham coverage. What is Ball Durham, Kevin? Well, we got everything you could possibly want about Duke basketball right now. Entering February, most fun time of season in college basketball. So um, you can come read us every single day for all your news, opinions, um, everything you could possibly want about this Duke basketball program. Duke basketball in North Carolina going head-to-head as top 10 opponents for the 49th time all time. That is the most in college basketball. Duke is 52-48 and 48 over the last 100 meetings against the Tar Heels that were so many years in a row where it was 50-50 and we're swapping who's winning as of late. Duke won both meetings a year ago. Obviously, North Carolina had those monumental victories at the conclusion of Coach K's career in the Final Four and his last game at Cameron Indoor. But Coach Shire, yet to lose to the Tar Heels this season. It is going to be a war. It is going to be an amazing basketball game on Saturday what are some of the things that you're looking at in this matchup, Kevin? Well, I'm looking to see how Duke defends the All-American R.J. Davis. And, yeah, I said All-American. He is playing at an All-American-like level for North Carolina, averaging 21.5 points per game. He is what makes them go. And I think it's going to be a really fun matchup between he and Jeremy Roach and Tyrese Proctor. I think Jeremy Roach has to be reinserted back into the Duke starting lineup. He came off the bench against Virginia Tech, obviously dealing with that ankle sprain. Um, that he suffered against Louisville. So I think he should be back in the starting lineup. Him and Tyrese Proctor, have your veterans in the backcourt for this game and bring Caleb Foster off the bench. Um, Also looking, have have to go down low for Armando Baycott, averaging uh, a double-double. Scoring numbers are down for him, at least in my opinion, because of how great R.J. Davis has been. Um, Armando Baycott really hasn't been demanding the basketball, averaging about 13.5 points per game with 10 rebounds. Now remember, it's going to be the first time that – Duke plays him with this roster configuration and no Derek Lively. Derek Lively was big. He had, what, eight blocks against them in, in Cameron, um, and he was big against them in the Dean, Dean Dome as well. Now it's going to be up to Kyle Filipowski playing that five position to defend Armando Baycott and try and stay out of foul trouble. That's going to be the biggest key for Duke against him. Um, and then Elliot Cadeau, the freshman for North Carolina, um, doesn't put up the most gaudy numbers, um, just a little under eight points per game. But he is the the glue piece for this North Carolina team. He holds everything together, averages about four assists per game, um, and he can take over a game if he needs to. He hasn't needed to a lot this year because they've had R.J. Davis playing at such a high level. But it's going to be interesting to see who Duke puts on um, Elliott Cadeau um, and how they match that going forward. Um, Certainly, it's going to be interesting uh, on Saturday night when these two teams meet for the first time this season. Yeah, I can't wait to watch it. So many storylines always each and every year that you have this game being played. College Game Day will broadcast live from there on Saturday morning. That's going to be exciting. I know that the Tar Heel fans will be out there in full force. 
Hopefully we get to see a lot of Duke blue uh, kind of right there behind the Duke bench and spread out throughout the Smith Center, and we can get a great environment on Saturday for this basketball game. You mentioned kind of the lineup and what it looks like for Duke. There's certainly the old saying that if it's not broke, don't fix it, and that regarding whether or not you bring Jeremy Roach back off the bench as he has this past two games or put him back into the starting lineup. Jeremy Roach, four of five from three against Virginia Tech, scoring 16 points. Caleb Foster was great for Duke against Virginia Tech. He scored eight of Duke's first 14 points. That's the only points he scored, however, as Foster only played 15 minutes in the basketball game. I did a little bit more digging, Kevin, and that is the fewest minutes that Foster has played all season except for that game against Arizona and Cameron Indoor where he played 13 minutes And that's a game in which, to remind people, Foster had no stats. Just got 13 minutes of cardio out there on the floor. Played pretty well for Duke against Virginia Tech earlier this week, but only 15 minutes. So maybe he would be the guy that you kind of slide over to the bench now and let Roach go back to the starting lineup. Yeah, I think that's the move John Shire has to make. Um, Jeremy Roach is your team's captain. He's the leader. Uh, He's got to be on the floor, especially for this game to start because – uh, I, I feel like Tyrese Proctor is going to start on R.J. Davis just because of how good a defender he's been this season. But you still want Roach out there for his leadership and his offense from the opening tip. You mentioned it a little bit ago, but looking at Saturday's game in particular, last thing to touch on here is, of course, Mark Mitchell, who is back. He's played the last few games returning from his knee injury, did have six turnovers against Virginia Tech. That kind of led to Duke having 14, their most so far this season. What is Mark Mitchell's role for a game like Saturday against North Carolina? Harass Harrison Ingram, the transfer <laughs> from Stanford. And that, that that's what it is. Harrison Ingram, he's been a really good piece for Hubert Davis. It's amazing how Hubert Davis has transformed this North Carolina offense from last year to this year. Obviously, last year, you're the preseason number one team in the country, and you missed the NCAA tournament. This year, people aren't as high on you in the preseason, and you've elevated yourself to a top three ranking, although that'll probably drop come Monday. Um, after this loss to Georgia Tech. But Harrison Ingram from Stanford has been great. He's averaging um, about 12 points per game, nine rebounds, uh, shooting 42% from the field and 40% from three-point range. So him and Mark Mitchell are going to be matched up against each other, and Mark Mitchell's defense is going to have to shine against Ingram. It's going to be awesome. We're going to be following along, obviously, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you once again next week, Kevin. I hope that we're recapping a Duke basketball victory uh, and looking forward to the rest of the month of February with the Duke team. One more time, kind of remind us where we can find all your work, Kevin. Everything's over at balldurham.com and on social media. You can follow us at ball underscore Durham. Thanks for the time today, Kevin. We'll do it again soon, okay? Can't wait, JJ. All right, that's Kevin Conley joining us here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils, and that's going to bring our show to a close. Once again, do us a favor. Be sure to check us out on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button to our channel. Watch us each and every day. Also, if you're listening to us on Apple Podcast, leave us a five-star rating and written review. Follow us on X at LO underscore Blue Devils. I'm there as well at underscore JJ underscore Jackson underscore. That'll do it for today's show. As always, go Duke. I'll talk to you tomorrow. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you and good day.